To me, the, um, the feeling is the next evolution of our, of our species. Because when we develop uh, felt perception, there's that saying, where there's love, there's no law. And in a, in a society where there's no feeling, there has to be law. Because when there's no feeling, <clears throat> there's no um, connection between action and consequence. So, so, so one can mentally justify anything and think something is a good idea mentally and do it. But if there's feeling involved, if we, once we develop felt perception, there's a connection between our thoughts, words and deeds and the consequences. We can feel the connection and that alone begins to govern us. So the heart begins to govern us as opposed to the head. <clears throat> so a person who has full developed felt perception can't send people to war because they can feel the consequence. And so that feeling will stop them and go, no, this is not the, the way or even uh, try to hurt somebody or steal from somebody or anything because that they will feel the consequence. That's the... So once humanity develops felt perception, you don't need to tell people how to behave and what is right and what is wrong and what is appropriate behavior. All of that, all the, there's no need for that law. There's, there's no need to make laws on how to not to cheat somebody, not to, because it can all be felt, the consequence can be felt. So immediately the heart lets us know what is the consequence. But while we're still in a very physical, mental place, um, we, we have some good ideas and we go, no, it would be a good idea to conquer that country and get the resources or whatever it is that we want. But we can't feel what happens to the children, what happens to the land. And even now, like that, like that mine over there, we can only do that because we can't feel. If we can feel, and uh, we, we, uh, feeling means there's no separation between me and this tree. I can, it's one and the same, I'm connected through the energy, through the feeling. So if I can feel the earth, there's not much chance that I'm going to make a big hole like that in the ground. Because it, it's, it's hurtful, it's, it's damaging not only to the earth, but all the, the, the plants, the insects, everything is suffering that used to live there. <laughs> so, so the, the felt perception is definitely the next step in our, in our evolution. But, it's, uh, but, but equally, it's, um, it's a challenging part of the journey because once one starts to feel more, we also get to feel the suffering in the world. And, and not only our own suffering, but to look at the world and, and, and feel the suffering of other beings. And that can also cause us to go, I don't want to feel too much. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a part of the journey that is, in my own experience that I'm discovering, where, where um, you, know, you get to feel what's going on around you and, and sometimes you, you don't want to feel that, you know. So the developing of felt perception is also, it, it has powerful fruits because it's going to give us the capacity to realize what peace is, because peace is a feeling. Love is a feeling. All these things are feelings that we are after. But on the way there, we're also going to feel, you know, the, the discomfort of being in the world. And, um, and part of developing the feeling body is to be able to feel the discomfort without reacting to it and just allowing ourselves to feel it so we can develop our own felt capacity and evolve through that without fiddling with it, without trying to save it or trying to fix it or trying to. But we can only do that <clears throat> really in the world when we can do it with ourselves. So when my own uh, um, anger comes up, do I see it as a valid experience or do I see it as something wrong that I must fix? And, and so only when I see that, no, my anger's coming up because it's something that's required for me to feel. And, and by feeling it, I develop my felt perception more. It's totally valid. 
so that when I see that about myself, then it's only when people are angry around me, I don't try and stop them or try and change their mind or make them understand something different that I can say, well, that person is angry because they're also going through that. That's the way that they're going through that experience. And it's valid for them, whether they realize it, whether they react to it or respond to it or not. Um, but the fact is their experience is valid. And, 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 and also, that too is also the, really the end of, of war between human beings because um, war is really about your experience is not valid and I'm going to bring an experience for you that you should be having. And if you don't have it, we will attack you. If you don't have the religion that I think you should have or if you don't see God the way I, the way I, I see God, then I'm going to have to change things for you. I'm going to have to attack you and force you to change. So it's only when I see that my experience in every moment is valid for my growth and my development, then I can see that everyone else's experience is valid, even if I don't understand it. The fact that it's happening to them, it's valid. And I, I would rather respond to it by treating it that way than uh, react to it by saying I need to change it. And, but it first becomes an acceptance in myself of my own experience. You know. And that's, it always has to start with how I'm relating to my own emotional body. How I'm, be, how I'm behaving towards my own emotional body is the way I'm behaving towards the world. They, they, they are one and the same thing. It's hard for us to see that because mostly we see our relationships with others. But like we were talking about <clears throat> unconditional love and learning about what that really means. And I can't be unconditional with another human being if I have placed conditions on what I'm allowed to feel and what I'm not allowed to feel and when I'm allowed to feel it and who I'm allowed to feel it in front of. When I'm doing that to myself and I'm placing those conditions on my own heart, then I'm going to be doing that to everybody around me. But I won't be looking at that inside of me. I'll be looking at others, how they're behaving. Right? So it always starts with my relationship. Initially, you know, I, I call it my relationship with my own emotional condition. <clears throat> but really it is my relationship with my own vibration. It's just that my interaction with my vibration initially is coming through the emotional body. So even anger is actually love in a distorted form because of the imprint in the emotional body. So, you know, I can't say, oh, I'm going to be okay with love, but I'm not okay with anger. But they're the same thing. They're just in a distorted form, right? And it's only when I look at anger and I say, well, this is really just love in a distorted form. So I'm not going to try and change it or fix it. I'm going to be with it with no condition. So it can move to a point of organic completion. Once I can do that with myself, <clears throat> then I'm able to be that way with other human beings. But if I'm being that way with other human beings and not being that way with myself, then my behavior towards others might look good, but it's going to be empty, really, of any consequence. Yeah. And, and that's often, you know, in the, in the teachings of the Tao, too. They also, <clears throat> you know, say, finally, when you're not doing everything, everything will be done. All right. And it's really like, when I'm not going around interfering with everybody, then everything will be as it is. But I can't do that until I'm that way with myself. Until I, if I get up in the morning and I feel uncomfortable and I can just say to myself, this is what's necessary for today. It doesn't make it more comfortable because I say that. It's still going to be uncomfortable. But being with it allows the energy to flow to a point of completion. And once it's completion, I receive insight and gifts from it. And when I see that about my own experience, then I can allow other people to have their own experience. And I, one of the questions that I often get is, <clears throat> well, does it mean I mustn't save the whales? Does it mean I mustn't, you know, do all this? And so what I say about that is that we know what our work is in the world by what is emotionally triggering us in an uncomfortable way. So if anything triggers my emotions in an uncomfortable way, <clears throat> what it's telling me 
is that whatever's happening externally is bringing an awareness of what's not integrated internally. It doesn't mean that I don't act. It doesn't mean that I don't take action because not doing or being with doesn't mean inactivity. There's always life requires action and momentum. But there's two different types of activity. So for example, if I have an encounter with you and something about what you say to me upsets me. <clears throat> if I'm a reactive being, I will address what you say immediately and go, don't talk to me like that. How dare you talk to me like that? And the next time you talk to me like that, that's it. We're not friends anymore, right? So I will try and control, you know, or what do you mean by what you're saying? What are you trying to say? I might mentally try and have some examination. But what this work has shown to me is that it, the first step is response. And the first response is to acknowledge within myself that I am on some level uncomfortable emotionally or on a felt level. And that's a causal point of me having this experience because someone else could be sitting next to me and hear you say the same thing and feel nothing. Have no, no, no reaction to it at all. It shows it's something to do with me, not you. Right? <clears throat> so in my experience, if I respond to it, and my responding means I allow myself to feel that discomfort inside myself first. I, I hear what you say. You have your say. We're having a conversation. I feel uncomfortable. But I put my attention on the discomfort and allow that discomfort to be there. And if I allow that discomfort to be there, it's like um, it digests. So it's like eating a banana. I don't have to tell a banana what to do when I eat it. I don't have to go, you know, go down, go to the left, you know, put some stomach acid here, put a bit of there. I don't have to do that. I eat the banana, it knows what to do. It's the same with the emotionals, emotional body. It's the same with the energy. You say something, it, it triggers me. I feel deeply uncomfortable. If I'm able to respond, I'm aware enough to respond. I may feel uncomfortable in front of you, but we keep talking. I don't address that, but I feel it. I allow myself to sit with the feeling. And, and what happens is that feeling, if I don't fiddle with it and change it and try and understand it and figure where does this come from and who did the, I just let it be there. It will move to a point of completion. And at that point of completion, I will receive some insight about what this was about. It will be insight, not from outside, from insight. At that point, I may want to discuss it with you. But it won't be discussion from a point of, you are doing this to me. It'll be a discussion from, this is what happened when we were together, to me. This was, when we were together, this is what happened. It's not your fault, this is what happened. So at that point, I may want to say, to address it to you, but I won't address it in a way that will make you defensive, as if it's an attack. It won't be a reaction at all. But 90% of the time, when it integrates in me, I won't need to say anything to you because you won't need to reflect that back to me once it's resolved within me. There's no need to reflect it back. But sometimes when we are in, like, in an intimate relationship with someone, we're living with the person. It's not someone I just meet at a coffee shop and I don't see them again. And I process that, I don't need to speak to them again. Sometimes I'm in an intimate relationship. It's my lover and she says something that is upsetting to me. So I process it. I digest it, I receive the insight. It's actually then valuable to say to her, you know that yesterday we were talking, having coffee, and you said something about my mother or my brother. I don't know if you noticed, but I, and she will have noticed because we're connected. She'll go, yeah, no, I saw you. Yeah. Well, it, it made me uncomfortable because it reminded, you know, I got the insight about what that was. but. You know, and me sharing it with my companion then, it actually brings us more intimate, intimacy. But not sharing from a point of changing her or even having that it's necessary that she understands anything about it, but just from a point of addressing what happened between us because we're living together and she will have noticed that there was a charged moment. But it's not good to discuss or to bring it up while I'm in the charge. 
of the emotional charge. Because either we're in charge or we're driven by a charge. And when we're driven by a charge, then it's going to be react. No matter what I say, it's going to be speaking from that child, from the hurt, from the victim, from the victor. And when I speak from that place, I'm talking to an attacker. And that person is going to feel defensive. But if I'm speaking from a responsive place, of, a, of the place of insight, it actually, it will bring us closer in our way of relating to each other. And, 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 the, and also what it will mean is the next time we're having a conversation and something happens, she may learn how, how to contain it, but she may also know that if she upsets me, it doesn't have to be addressed straight away because I'm going to process it and digest it. And later, I will share with her what it was about. And that, that creates a greater sense of intimacy. And that's what intimacy is. Intimacy is into me and see into me and see. So being with her helps me see deeper into myself, not into you and see, into me and see. And, and, and that's the, the journey of intimacy, is it? being with someone in a way that enables me to see myself clearer, have a, a deeper awareness of myself, my own inner world. And the more I'm, I'm at peace with my own inner world, the more I'm going to be at peace with that person no matter what's going on in their inner world. It's just a, it's an immediate. If, if the emotion is allowed to be there, the energy, the uncomfortable energy, it will digest just like food, it's just emotional food. And once it digests, there will be nutrition. And the nutrition won't be, it'll be an insight. And an insight is a knowing that is whole and complete. So you can share it with somebody as an understanding, but when you receive it, it's nothing you have to think about. What was this? When did this happen? How? You just know. Ah, aha. Then you can share it. So then you can use the mental body to, 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 to make the communication with the other person. But, uh, but sometimes, and, and on many cases, it's not necessary because it's really for us. Unless that person goes, what happened yesterday? When we were talking, I saw you, what was that? And then you can say, oh, it was, you know, if they want to know. But the, I found in doing intimacy work with someone that when you did go through something, um, the person that I did uh, intimacy work with, we used to call it bench work. Right. Bench work, to sit on a bench together. And sometimes we would be walking together and suddenly there would be something, <gasps> So we would go and sit on a bench, her and myself, and just sit in the, the, in the uncomfortable feeling and just sit, sit. And you want to run away, you want to f f kill it, you want to end it, it's because it's a death experience. Emotional integration is a death, it's the death of a past experience that's not yet integrated. So when we go through that death experiences, our mental body is thinking death thoughts, which is this is the end. I can't do this anymore, it's over. But if you just sit, no speaking, and just sit together, sit, sit in the energy, eventually it, it integrates. And when it integrates, you know because you start laughing. It's like, <laughs> you know, and then you can speak about it. And then it's, it brings you closer. It creates a, 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 a powerful union. But not to speak from the wounded place that's not there's no value in it because the only one that's speaking then is the hurt child not the not the adult with the insight all right and that's why a lot of verbal therapy or relationship therapies they can go on forever and they don't really work because both people are speaking as wounded children they're not speaking as they're not they haven't digested the experience they're still busy blaming the other person for the experience that they're having and not taking responsibility for it and and that's the thing about emotional work is the responsibility is because no one can feel for me the responsibility of what i feel is mine i can't ask you to feel on my behalf this is not possible you can do mental and physical things for me, but you can't feel on my behalf. And because you can't, I am completely responsible for how I feel about anything. No matter if it looks like the outside world is to blame. 
The fact is you can put 10 people there in the same situation and only maybe one or two of them will feel badly about it. The others will go, hmm, you know, not even notice it. And that shows it's an internal, uh, exp and, and something ha happening internally for the person that's uncomfortable. This is the thing about the mental body. The mental body is trying to find a formula, almost, of how it should work. And if we can just make it work like that all the time, then everything's going to be fine, you see. But actually, if you have an experience like that, that's valid. So, uh, you know, th that's the whole thing about it. If it's happening in the moment, whatever it is, is going to be valid. Whether you have an experience of being an observer, or having an experience of completely losing yourself in the experience. And it's kind of like that, I find. Um, one of the shortfalls of what we can think of as spirituality is it kind of creates this idea that there's an ideal experience. For example, and an enlightened experience. And once I have an enlightened experience, then I'm always going to be enlightened. But actually, that's both happening. It's like you can be the ocean, and you can be the wave. And it's actually important to, to allow both to happen. And uh, where, we, where we have a problem is we get attached to the wave. Where, I want this wave only, and no other way. This was the perfect wave, and there'll never be another one. So we get, you know, and we forget the whole ocean, right? But it's important to be, be a wave and to be an ocean, and to know that there's a rhythm and a tide of that awareness. So, for example, and sometimes in my life, I'm completely present. Other times, I'm completely lost. It seems like I'm lost in my experience. I'm just even reactive. What's going on, right? And then I come out of it and I go, ah, I'm back. Okay, I'm back again. But it, it was a teaching. It was a way of, it's, it's kind of hard to learn about something if you're an observer. You have to almost go into the experience and become part of it to the point that you even forget all your wisdom, all your tools, everything, so you can have an experience, a full experience. And then there'll be insight from the experience and then, then the tide comes out and you're back and you, you're the ocean again. And you go, oh, I know it's, it's not real. It's just, it'll, it'll pass. It's just life. And then other times, it's, it matters. It's, yes, it must be like this, you know, and then you learn from yourself. So the mistake that we make is the, an idea that we're always got to be in this, this enlightened place. And I think there's a, <clears throat> look, there are people that appear to accomplish that and always, I don't know if you can play poker with them and, and, and go out, I don't know, because I don't know any of them, but, but <clears throat> I think it's important to, to in life to be swept up by it and to also to be able to stand back and to, and to know that those, those are rhythms like a tide. And so when I'm in, in it, let me be in it. And when I'm observing it and not so attached to it, let that also be true, right? And not feel like I have to be one way or another at a particular time to try and force it. Because then that's again, manipulation. So, so if someone says something and and it's, 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 you know, one of the things that I discovered about my experience. When I'm angry, I'm angry. It doesn't matter how much emotional work I've done. If you make me angry, I'm angry. I can't say now, now because I know about emotional development, when I get angry, I'm actually not going to be angry. It's going to be, no, when I'm, that's what makes it anger. When I'm angry, I'm angry. When I'm sad, I'm sad. When I'm afraid, I'm afraid. And so when we process emotions, we think that because we know about it and we've read a book about it and we know the process, that now when I get upset, I shouldn't be upset. But actually it's not true. The fact is when I'm upset, I'm upset. And what's, what's honest is to be upset. But what we want to do is gain the, the awareness not to react to that experience and say, I shouldn't be angry and I'm now going to smile instead. Yeah, I can feel angry. The main thing is I don't tell a story and I don't take it out on, on somebody else. But I let the anger be there because the anger is, is a food for me. It's part of a, in fact, it's not anger. 
I mean, we put that label on it. It's just an energetic circumstance in the emotional body that is, has a lot of heat and is very uncomfortable. That's really, it's, it doesn't even have a word, it's a feeling. And so can I, can I allow that feeling to be valid? It's a valid. And if I do and digest it, there will be emotional growth and insight and many beautiful things that come from it. It's like taking a bitter medicine. Uh, people will want the medicine to taste like candy all the time, but it doesn't. Sometimes the very good medicine is bitter. Right? It's like, um, <clears throat> like peyote. A peyote tea must be the most foulest substance ever created in the whole universe. I cannot believe there's anything that smells and tastes as bad as that. But it's a door. If you're going to go, no, I want a bit of sugar, but, you know, then you're not going to have that experience. That's a doorway because, and it's the same with emotional development. Emotional development is not about easy. It's not about good. It's not about fun. It's about going in and seeing what's there. And if what's there is rage, then to experience the rage, but in a way that responds to it rather than reacts to it. So you react? Oh, uh, well, <clears throat> we need to take care of your equipment. <laughs> I'm happy to sit in the rain, but your, your equipment, we just don't want. We'll just watch and see that there's not a big downpour. But I like the rain. Mm. Yeah, I think we confuse joy and happiness. So, um, <clears throat> It's more a case of allowing all emotions, emotional states. A joyful person is a person, it doesn't mean a joyful person is always smiling, but a joyful person is a person who allows all the emotional experiences in their life to be there. It's not a someone who's going, I only want to feel this, but I don't want to feel that. If I'm feeling happy, then I'm, a, then I'm, a joy, then I'm in joy. If I'm not feeling happy, then my joy is gone. So the joy for me is a, is a state in which I allow all the emotions to be there. I don't pick one or the other. And, and that's, I think I make that discernment because happiness is a different thing, although it's semantics. So some people may mean the same thing. You know, you may go to China and they might mean happiness is joy, you know. But um, happiness in our Western civilization has been this must happen and that mustn't happen. And if that happens, or what, what I want to happen happens, then everything's going to be okay, then I'm going to be happy. So it's a kind of controlling the experience to, to have a certain outcome. Um, joy uh, is not about that for me. Joy is about whatever happens in that experience, I'm going to be with it, I'm going to respond to it, I'm going to allow it. I'm not going to push things out so I can have a particular type of experience. I'm not going to manipulate. So happiness requires manipulation on some level. Um, and, and, and I think a lot of our, um, our symptoms of, uh, uh, of, of discomfort in society, even to the terms of pollution and the things that we do, are about trying to be happy, are about trying to manipulate the experience because we have somehow convinced ourselves or been convinced that there needs to be a very particular outcome. Um, a, a sexual experience is a good way of explaining it. Some people are only happy, some men are only happy if they have an orgasm. If they don't have an orgasm, if they can't have an orgasm, then it's not a sexual experience. They're going in for the orgasm, that's it. Um, there's a different level of sexual experience one can have if one says, okay, the orgasm isn't the destination, actually it's the intimacy, it's being close to this person and actually giving them love and giving them a good physical feeling and, and, and giving them my undivided attention. That's what I'm, have, I'm, I'm wanting. So I would rather give that than trying to get something. And so joy is more in that state of it's a journey, everything is allowed, um, I'm here to give something to it, I'm here to respond to it. Happiness is more, more it's a destination, this is exactly what I'm looking for and if I don't get that it's not going to be right for me. So they're two different energies and I, I've given that exact um, <clears throat> uh, recommendation to people especially people that are that say they're sex addicts or 
you know, they, they, you know, I say, you know, go and sit in a coffee shop. And they go, well, if, you know, I see a beautiful woman, I start fantasizing and I, you know, and I go, well, look, it's not the, f you can't blame the beautiful woman, the woman that's beautiful to you. She's not really the issue. But the fact is you can be very grateful she's there, right? Because it's a blessing to see a beautiful woman, especially a woman that makes you feel something. That's a, that's a gift to me. That's, God was in a good mood when he set that situation up, right? But the thing is, do you have to tell the story and go into the fantasy? And do you have to carry out the physical behavior that your body is? Or can you sit there in the coffee shop? Or can you look at the woman, tune in with the feeling that it's coming up for you, then turn away and sit with that feeling? and digest that feeling. Because if you can, on many levels, you're going to have a much better relationship with women. And it's the same with women and men. I mean, it's not about, it's, it's the same. <clears throat> but really, instead of turning that, that, that powerful feeling into a, a plan of action, <laughs> right? can, it just, can it just be in the body and stay there? And can you, can you be with it? Because that too, that to me leads to joy, right? And, and, and if that feeling can be digested and at some point you can have an intimate experience with a woman and be at that place with it, forget, uh, forget enlightenment and nirvana and all that stuff, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because that's a beautiful thing, you know, that's... Yeah. And also, you know, and, and in the, um, uh, I still want to write <clears throat> about what I call the ascension of sexuality. And I think it's really important that we ascend our relationship with sexuality. And our, our relationship with sexuality is very dysfunctional. And because it's, to me, the, 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 the sexual experience is how love comes into the world. Because out of the sexual experience is a, like a portal. And out of the experience not only comes children, but those it comes a relationship. It's a way of being together. That gets passed to the child. The child takes its definition of love from that, that union between two people. So that union between two people is like a portal for love to come into the world. And if that union is about manipulation and about destination and about getting my pleasure and about get, 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 and me, 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 then the love in the world becomes based on that. So when I say I love someone, what I'm really saying is I want to get something from that person. It's about me, and I want something. So there's a, an ascension of sexuality that's required for us as a species. And one of the things about that is the removal of the destination. And so, like what we're saying, if one can be with somebody and there's no destination, even the movement in sexuality becomes less. It's not like because a lot of sex is just violence, you know, it's just, like, <laughs> it's just crazy violence, you know, and, and it's actually violence on a woman, a lot of it, it's, it's violence. And so if one can be with someone one feels great love for and just be almost still with them in a sexual way, not trying to get anywhere or go anywhere and just be in that feeling, then something else begins to open. The vibrational realm opens to us through that. And I'm sure that, the, that on some level, the reason why religions usually, their first point of assault is sexuality. They will somehow assault sex, human sexuality, control it, confine it, put laws around it. Because it's a known fact that if two people come together and experience true intimacy, and into that vibrational. <laughs> they don't need a priest to know God. <laughs> they don't need a book to read to know God. They will know what God is through that union. And, and, and to me, that portal is a portal to bring love into the world and to realize love while we're in the world. And that's why we call it making love. But really it's about not so much making love, but realizing what love is. And it requires there being no destination because love doesn't have a destination. It's a journey. And so the ascension of our sexuality is very important because until we ascend our 
our way of approaching sexuality, um, we are not going to change the world at all. Because the world is a manifestation of our definition of love as it currently is. And until that, that, that becomes undefined, all those conditions are taken off, we're going to keep breeding children who have a particular perception about what love is, and they will continue to enter the world and go, love is 50,000 a month, love is a big car, love is a woman who looks in a particular way, love is these things, and unless I get that and make that happen, and that's where the conflict comes and the manipulation. And, the, and so it begins to me, it actually begins um, right with the orgasm, because to me the orgasm, you know, I, I, I ask people, what is an orgasm? I mean, have you ever stopped and asked yourself, what is, what is this experience we call the orgasm? You know, and I did, I asked myself that. And for me, the answer was, it's a point of light. It's a, it's a concentrated point of light that can be felt. A felt, concentrated point of light. And whatever mental and physical aspect you bring to that mag is magnified through that point of light and is manifest. So whatever's happening when, when a, a union happens between two people, whatever is going on mentally in that process is being, it's a point of manifestation, it's a point of creation. This entire universe came out of an orgasm, right? It was, came out of a point of light, right? That's the power of the orgasm. No wonder religions want to control that. Don't let human beings know what an orgasm is because they will create, they will manifest without, you know, exactly what they require. And so, yeah, we can make babies. I mean, think of it, that point of light can bring a whole life that can get up and walk around, and, right? That point of light, it's powerful. But it can also manifest a civilization. It can manifest all sorts of things. It can manifest, if you want to write a book, that point of light can, if you can stay conscious and aware during that point of light, about what it is that you are manifesting, it will bring it about at an accelerated rate because it's a point of creation. And everybody has access to it. Everybody. But what are we using it for now? Right? What are we using it for? What are we manifesting? We're manifesting poverty, lack, war, violence, all through what's happening in us as we experience it. It's being magnified through that point of light. And that's why we need to ascend sexuality to, so that we know how sacred and powerful it is. And until we become responsible around that, we're going to live in a continual state of unconsciousness and chaos. So, for example, um, the parents of someone like Jesus. We don't know much about the parents, but I, I, I can tell you that they were trained in the mystery schools before they had that child, wow. right? And they went through emotional processing and processing and processing. And that's what's called uh, a virgin birth. It means the emotional body is clear. Okay? You understand? So, so when a child is born from a parent who have done that work, they come in as a virgin birth. And that child is vibrational, is a vibrational being. There's no con there, are, there are no conditions in that child's emotional body. There's no, it's a completely open vibrational being. That's why Jesus was born in a stable with animals, because they didn't want human beings around that baby, because animals, what's the difference between animals and us? Animals are present. They don't, they're not, right? So the, they wanted a presence of life around it, not people with ideas and imprinting it, right? It's the same work that Jesus did with Mary Magdalene. And we don't get told about any of that. You know, the first thing was get rid of Mary Magdalene, turn her into a prostitute and get rid of her, right? But uh, the, the actual fact was, you know, the intimacy work that those two did together. Uh, powerful intimacy work. That's all part of the journey. Once you take that away from the journey, once you take that out of the picture, you cannot have the whole picture about what it is to be human and, and, and how it is to and how it is we relate with God. 
we're, you know, it, it, gets, it just gets lost. Then we need to go to somebody who's a priest, who's learned out of a book, who's wearing a particular uniform and has particular rituals and ceremonies. And they themselves are connected because of their education or their degree or whatever they've done. But actually, the real connection comes through that union. You know, that's a real powerful connection. And so I'm very dubious about any so-called spiritual journey that alienates sexuality. Because it's, it's pushing God aside. Right? It's pushing God aside. Immediately, whatever God is, it's being pushed aside. That, that creative source of everything. And it, it can be experienced between two people directly. In fact, it's a chalice. When people come together, that's what the chalice is. They come together and they open and that energy comes in. And there is a way of doing that between the mental body and the emotional body. Because the mental body is outward going and it interacts with the physical world. The emotional body is inward going and it interacts with the vibrational world or what, what we call the spiritual world. So the job of a man when he's with a woman is to create a completely safe space for her. He can't create safe space if he wants to, her to be an orgasm vehicle for him, right? His job is to create a safe space so she can go in during the experience and contact the vibrational inside of herself, right? And as it comes through her, it comes through him and out into the physical world. And that's the channel, that's the portal, right? If you destroy that relationship between the male and the female, or the mental body and the emotional body, there's no connection with God. And then you have to go and do things and you know, build churches and write books and give all of these things which have really are, each one of them is getting further and further away from what it is. And that's the importance of sexuality. And the important, it's such an, it's, a, it's, a, it's the portal of love. God is love, it's the portal of love, it's the portal of God. And until we treat it with that level of sacredness, and, and that relationship between the man and the woman is within us. So it's how am I relating with my emotional body? Because my emotional body leads me into the vibrational. My mental body leads me into the physical. Is my mental body putting rules and legislations and laws and is trying to manipulate my emotional body to get some destination, some orgasm, some feeling I'm supposed to be having rather than... Or is my mental body working with my physical body to create a safe space for my heart so that my heart can go in and contact the vibrational because if it opens to the vibrational it just comes rushing through me into the world right and then what I focus on manifests you know the love comes into the world through that so we have the portal with inside ourselves and that's why the intimacy work first begins with me and my emotional body before it begins with me and a woman there's no ways I'm going to give a woman a safe space to be when I'm close to her if I'm still manipulating my own emotional body to gain some sort of outcome that I think is necessary. Yeah. Mm. That's why I love women so much, because they're, to me, the, the key, in my experience, to, to God. To me, a woman is the key to God. In the world we live in at the moment, man is the key to God. And that's because the mental body has taken over as God. No, it says, the mental body says, I think, therefore I am. The, does that mean when you're not thinking that you don't exist? Right? And so... The, the, sh the shift has, has to be to, to, to allow a woman to take the role, to take the position of that connection with the vibration. And if you can make the image of a woman into a prostitute, you've destroyed that connection, right? Immediately, boom, it's over. 
And that's how we use women in the world. They're either prostitutes or breeders. But they cannot be what they really are, which is a portal into the vibrational for us. For the whole world, right? And and that's only when we only when they are allowed to become what they are again, will we be at peace and have abundance and a joyful, magnificent experience on this planet. Otherwise, we will it's just gonna stay in this condition of conflict and chaos and manipulation and pollution because we have no connection to God. If we had if we really had a connection to what God was, we wouldn't be treating this planet the way we are. We wouldn't be treating each other the way we are. We wouldn't be treating ourselves the way we do. The only reason those behaviors are unfolding is because the portal to God has been closed for humans. And it's been closed by religion and a lot of spirituality, a lot of spiritual paths, they go. You must abstain from being human. You must abstain from love. You must abstain from this. You must abstain. And it's... Uh, and I, I have tried all those abstainings. <laughs> you just become empty vehicle. And then the mental body has to make up stuff about what, you know, make up all these, you know, macabre vehicles and these metaphysical plans and things and all because we can't be close to a woman. So I have to make all this stuff up. And, you know, so it, it really does for me go back and that's why I want to do, you know, at some point to do that book, you know, where it realigns. It's the same working with the pathway of awareness as I do in, in, the, in, the, in the presence process. You know, from the, the pathway of awareness is from the vibrational through the emotional, through the mental into the physical. Through the emotional, not through the mental. We don't get there by understanding at all. And, and um, you know, in, in the sexual experience of intimacy, the task of the mental body or the male, let's say, in that experience is to navigate, is to create a safe space, but also to be, keep the mental image of what's being required, of what's to hold that space. The woman is to feel as deeply as possible the experience. And the deeper she goes into the felt aspect, that's what opens her to the vibrational. And then the portal opens and the vibrational comes through the woman, not through the man's orgasm, through the woman. And the man will have an orgasmic experience that is way bigger than the tip of his penis, you know, because it, it rushes through the whole experience of the mental body and it blesses the whole physical physicality of the world around them. It's a blessing. And if two people are being that way with each other, you see wherever they go, people are, it's like they've taken ecstasy or something. Everyone is like, wow, what is this feeling, right? This is, right? It's, it, it radiates into the world. That's how you bring love into the world. I go for it. <laughs> yes, I know it's a hard job, but I'm up for it. <laughs> we need a few dedicated men. <laughs> yeah, but we first have to allow the woman to feel safe. And for a woman to feel safe in this world is very hard. She, women don't even know how unsafe they feel. They're so used to it. They don't even know how unsafe they are, feel. It must be, I could not imagine being a woman in this world. So difficult. You know, persecuted on every level. And not allowed to be what they are, which is portal. Every morning and every night when Jesus woke up and when he went to sleep, his mother would say, you are not a, a physical, mental, emotional being trying to have a spiritual experience. You are, or in my, the language I prefer, having trying to have a vibrational experience. You are a vibration having a physical, mental, emotional expression. And remember that, that you are what you really are. Not who you are, but what you are is a vibration. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>